You've seen them on the stage and screen and likely passed them a dollar bill or two over the years. But what does it cost to get started? And what can one hope for? You're listening to Queer Money, episode 510. And today we're talking about the economics of being a drag queen. Denver's own Jessica Lahore joins us to share all the deets. A Colorado native, Jessica is an award-winning and up-and-coming national queen. She won the Colorado State University Drag Show in 2013, and most recently, the best new queen on the scene. Jessica is a proud grandmother of three drag kids, and you want to keep an eye out for her. We've wanted to do this show for years, so let's get down to business. One Auto Navigator does more than just auto financing. We're here to help you find a car you love, too. Shop millions of cars from thousands of dealers nationwide. Research your favorite makes and models. Explore dealers near you and more. All on Auto Navigator. Well, folks, we are super excited for our show today. This is actually the first time that we've ever had a drag queen on Queer. I know. Queen. We're not worthy. And I, I will <laughs> say we have been, we've been pushing for a long time to try to get someone to come on. And so we're super excited that uh, Jessica, Jessica Lahore is joining us from Colorado. Well, our home. One of our favorite states ever. Yeah, exactly. So we'll have some comments about being in Colorado. So thank you very much for joining us, Jessica. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really, really stoked for today. I think we're going to have some really fun conversations. So yeah, Very fun and informative, I think. Yeah. It is interesting. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a backstory as to why we wanted to have a drag queen on the show. Um, a, a while back, uh, 2019, John and I were approached to, quote unquote, sponsor a television show that highlights drag queens. Um, and uh, we had to to decline because we, we are a budget. micro business with <laughs> two people and we didn't have six figures to throw at this company to be able they to have poster putty them. holding those those uh, pictures up <laughs> 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 um but it got off this whole conversation going on in my head um around this whole idea of what do drag queens spend how do they run their businesses and with so many uh so many folks um admiring the business and wanting to get into that business, we wanted to be able to provide some people with some real life examples of what it was like, um, what it's like getting started, how much you spend, those kinds of things. So we're super excited for you to be willing to uh, unveil get the layers and, and, and <laughs> give us some truth about uh, drag queen money, right? So yeah, it's dirty, sweaty, crumpled up money, but it is money for sure. That sounds like a good Friday night. Any way that we can get it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Right. So um, one of the things that you uh, have listed as your core values is work hard, play hard, and slay humble. So what does that really mean? Because we want to know a little bit about you um, before we dive into the money. So I've always taken any kind of opportunity, even earlier on in my career, the play hard piece is that I've, I've kept this consistent in terms of how I book my schedule out for at least eight years, eight of the 10 and a half years that I've, I've been doing this. And when I was doing this earlier on, uh, it was difficult because other folks weren't doing that unless you were on a popular TV show or a pageant title holder or something like that. So I kind of treated myself in the way that like I was willing to do any gig for any amount of money, tip spots, exposure spots, uh, anything that I could do to fill my calendar because every time I got in drag, that was an opportunity to learn more about makeup, costuming, get more comfortable on the microphone. But it was approached in a way that was like Jessica's taking up every show spot that exists and Jessica is uh, just greedy with her show opportunities and, and everything like that. And it really was never that intention. I was broke needing to pay student loans and medical bills. So I wanted to work and enhance my craft. So that's the work hard. The play hard piece, I guess, is that there's always a mixture and a balance with Jessica Lahore about your professional and your personal relationships. And in the drag industry, that can really rub some people the wrong way. Um, I'd say any kind of entertainment, there's so much personality piece to it where you're trying to build friendships and tell people that they're talented and you love them to perform. But at the end of the day, this is your business, the way that I want to run it to make sure that I'm taking care of the venues, taking care of and every other aspect. So the play hard is I'm happy to drink and spend my money on a couple of drinks or, or to go out with friends and stuff. But when I'm at the show, that is, that is my job. I'm, I'm there to work when I have certain meetings, I'm there to work and separating those out. Even if you're my best friend, my good Judy, 
is difficult for some folks, but mm. that's the work hard, play hard. And I guess the stay humble piece is you never know when these opportunities will be taken away from you. And if there's anything that COVID really proved, it's that you have to get creative uh, when things are taken from you. And we never expected any of that to shut down the world. Like we've talked about, I'm sure many conversations about everything being shut down. But when people approach you and they want to give you praise for the works that you're doing, how do you accept something as simple as a compliment and say, thank you very much while not taking it so far that it doesn't make you approachable, that it doesn't, uh, your, what I call diva moments, which I think happen in all drag people, uh, where how do you fight for, um, better pay? How do you make relation? How do you, how do you, how do you, or how are you assertive in conversations while also understanding that you're not the hottest thing to exist? Like there are other people that are willing to do your same job. There are other folks that do it maybe the same level or different or better in other realms. But the humble piece is remembering that those can be taken away from you and you can go from being the biggest star to being a nothing just as much as that person that's a nothing uh, could be your boss. Yeah. So that's, that's where that, that mentality comes from. Like you, I'm curious when you have people constantly applauding you all the time and screaming at you to do more and more and more, how hard is it do you find to stay humble? <laughs> I imagine it's, you're up on stage. People are like cheering you on. I imagine that, that you can't help that, but that be an ego boost. So how do you like say, okay, yeah. just He's inside the, the head of Madonna bit. right now. <laughs> what? <laughs> He's inside the head of Madonna right now. Thinking oh my about gosh. Madonna. <laughs> Getting all those. No yeah, Madonna. <laughs> Madonna's a whole different category of diva. She can, she's like, she can do whatever she wants to. Uh, no, you're, you're not wrong. There's like three different pieces to that. I'm gonna, I, I feel like I compartmentalize a lot in, mm -hmm. in my brain when it comes to conversations like this. So yes, that praise from the audience in the midst of a show is incredible. We feed off of that energy. We give you probably better, more personable hosting, better performances with more energy and more intention. And we want to, and I want to create the show experience for you. I'm talking about those compliments kind of off stage. People, especially as, as I've gotten more popular, have come up to me. They want to tell them the impact that I've made in their lives or something that I've said or put out content wise that has resonated with them. And sometimes it's just sitting and letting that person speak. Um, but a lot of people will always go up to me and be like, oh, you are the best queen in Denver or in Colorado. You, uh, no one's doing it. You're the hardest working queen. And, and as much as I say, thank you very much, I always follow up and say, know that I'm one of many hardworking entertainers in the city. I am one of several of the best. So I'm not denying what they're saying and I'm kind of accepting it, even if I don't believe it. And also reminding people that I'm not, I'm not the it girl. There are plenty of other entertainers in the scene. I guess that's where the humble piece comes in. And people think yeah. that it's part of the facade. It makes me very uncomfortable. Compliments make me so uncomfortable. And it really? took a while to even get to that place where I wasn't saying, no, you're wrong, but thanks. And that doesn't make anybody feel good. That's not how you right. build a fan base. And right. it also negatively impacts your mindset of what you think you're capable of doing. So just switching some of the wording. Thank you very much. I am a hardworking queen here in Colorado, but I'm one of many hardworking queens that are all doing different things. I love that. I, I, yeah. th I think in your conversation and what you've just said to us, there are a couple of things that I, I would definitely pull out um, that I see. One, you call this a business. And for a lot of people, they don't necessarily, they just think, oh, we're having fun. We're going to get up and dance and we're going to get dressed up. And, you know, uh, if, if you don't treat your way of making money like a business, especially if you're on your own and you're not getting a paycheck from somebody else, it's going to be a hard slog for it's you. Suck. It's, it's going to suck. Right. And there are people that want to just dance, get done up, and this is not their main form of income, or they do this for fun, or it's a hobby or self-expression, and that's completely okay right, to right. each their own on what they want to do. But it's the folks that say they want to take this seriously, and there's so many things that they could tweak or change or just have a little bit of a, a stricter mindset, a little bit more dedication in different areas or um, – conversations about what that means like what does a business mean to you that refuse to do it yeah i guess that makes me wonder how did you oh, i'm sorry were you gonna... well i was just gonna say i'm definitely gonna add one other thing there this idea of you being complimented for being the hard, being hard working um I, I just could tell by what you were saying about your early on in your career and even up to today consistency right and we look at people who are who are like 
why is my social media not blowing up? Why am I not viral? Why did this post, you know, it, but you see the people who are the people who are posting every single day, they have relevant content, they're engaging, it's interesting, right? And the same thing goes for anybody who's trying to sell themselves a persona as their business, whether it's us as podcast hosts, or you as a queen, or uh, somebody who's a uh, plays a musical instrument as their way of making money. We have to be consistent in putting ourselves out there. And I, I think that's probably one of the contributors to your success. A hundred percent. And that's from shows that I've been a cast on for 10 years now, the two venues that I've worked with for eight, I would say arguably of the entertainers in the city, uh, not in any way of tooting my own horn, I have probably the best rapport with venues, shows, the consistency of when I do them, what I bring to the venue, how I'm constantly altering them. But one thing that you mentioned is social media. We have to realize it does impact so much of what we're doing in this world, but the focus on it, the hyper-focus, the what you started with when you're saying, well, why isn't this happening for me? That's where that toxicity comes in and your business will struggle if all you're focused on are, well, I only got 10 likes or no one's sharing this or why is that person's video viral and I'm better than them and my content's better than them. That focus on social media impact needs to be balanced with a, I'm just building a resume. I'm putting out content because it's content I enjoy and people will resonate with and they enjoy, but I can't do it with the intention of trying to blast off and, and have my worth be based off of the numbers and the responses. You'll get those really great moments, but I know so many people that get stuck in their head that could be successful in this industry or successful drag business people that are so hell bent on the fact that their video isn't getting a certain amount of views. Or they don't have enough followers on Instagram. And it sucks because when you're not on certain TV shows or if you're not on, on certain programs or whatever, people don't look at you or care about anything that you have to offer if you're not at a certain following count on Instagram or subscribers on YouTube. And that's kind of where you get kind of conflicting feelings about it. Yeah, no doubt. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One, N.A., member FDIC. So I'm curious, you, you referred to it a couple times. When did, um, it's a two-part question. When did you realize you wanted to make this a business for yourself and not have it be just a form of, of, of self-expression and, and fun for yourself? And then when did you realize um, that you could make money doing this? So this is, I probably have three different phases. So 10 and a half years doing drag, eight and a half, seven, seven and a half to eight and a half as a full-time entertainer. So um, performing, emceeing, uh, event production, uh, consultations, like event cons cons consulting, uh, working with companies on inclusivity. So broadening out a little bit of the services that I provide. Um, I started doing this full time because I walked into my hosting and serving job at an old location, uh, queer bar here that brought us in and said, oh, we're closing our doors today. Everybody's out of work. You have two weeks of pay. Take whatever food you want and you can drink all the liquor, whatever. And I was hard. I was like, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I literally was like, I barely can afford the place that I'm living in. I I have no money. I can't get around. I have no capacity to survive right now. And I just lost my job. Um, I had just moved down to Denver from Fort Collins, which is about an hour away. I was traveling and driving back and forth because I was in school at the time. And I took that as a universal sign to really start the hustle, I guess is what it is. Doing any show possible, any opportunity possible for any amount of money. Um, I do a thing called being respectfully persistent with show producers. How do you constantly reach out to get booking? So that was like the first initial step of getting into it. When I realized that I could make money on it was probably about three years after that. The first six months to a year of me trying to make this full time were the worst, most depressing, suicidal, awful years where I could not survive and function or eat or anything. The two years following that, I started to get more traction with the consistencies that you're talking about. How was I going to get on a mic and come up with my own Rolodex of uh, hosting material? Um, what was my brand going to offer as Jessica Lahore? 
I wanted it to be rotating looks. You're always going to get something different. I wanted it to be storytelling. I wanted it to be stage presence. I wanted it to be um, com comedy, but a feel good vibe. And so two years after that, those first two years, all those struggling, I was able to make money off of it. I said, I just wanted enough money to pay my rent, to pay for my student loans. So I didn't have to deal with my parents for the co-signing thing. And I wanted enough to be able to like function adequately throughout the month. I didn't really have any money in those two years uh, anyway, but I was able to do enough to pay the bare minimum of what I needed to do. Uh, and I wanted to get out of c credit card debt entirely because I was a stupid drag queen and thought, oh, I'm going to bring up eight credit cards and buy all my drag and then <laughs> be forced to pay them back. Um, and then the third phase was really COVID. COVID, I almost quit drag. I looked for an office job. I tried to get a nine to five. I tried to get an event production job and nobody would hire me. It was either nobody would hire me because technically on a resume, they couldn't quantify my experience as a producer, a finance person. Even if I worded it differently, they could not wrap their head around it being adequate skills to, to actually get the job. And the mm -hmm. other piece is that Jessica got in the way many times of me getting a, a job in Denver because I would avoid talking about her. I would avoid bringing her up. And I remember mm -hmm. being in an interview and one of the coworkers literally from their office said, Oh my God, is that Jessica Lahore? Because of my voice came in oh. and I didn't, and ruined the interview essentially oh, for no. me. Oh, um, but it made me think when I couldn't get an office job, I completely rebranded what I wanted Jessica Lahore to be from the way that I was putting out my, um, uh, logos to the way I was posting online to the messages I was bringing into it, my drive, my mental health all changed. And that's when I realized that uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022 were my most successful years in drag. 21 and 22 were my most financially successful years in drag. And I felt like I got it. And it has yeah. proved. like where I'm coming from business wise. Nice. Nice. So let's go. You do, you mentioned uh, a lot of great stuff. Yeah. Here. Appreciate all of that. Um, and congratulations to you for sticking with it. Tenacity and sticking with it, especially during the ups and downs of a business is probably one of the most important things. Most entrepreneurs dealt with this during COVID, right? This whole idea of I've got to figure out how to keep this going. Um, let's go back to your, your roots. You got your big break in Fort Collins. Um, yes. <laughs> back Collins has a special place in my heart. <laughs> oh, my yeah? First, my first boyfriend in, uh, in Colorado was from, uh, uh, he went to Fort Collins. So they did the drive. They did the <laughs> drive, drive back all and forth between. Denver we drove and back from tracks at two, three, four, five, six, seven in the morning. So many times. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely know that drive too well. <laughs> I actually enjoy the drive. It's a pretty drive and it's pretty easy, so it wasn't too bad. Yeah. So back in 2013, you were Colorado State University. Uh, you were at Colorado State University drag show. It was when you really kind of got your big big break. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah. Uh, at that time, I wasn't really out in drag to my family or out in the drag world as the other pieces. And so this was my first time on stage. I remember seeing the show the year prior. And I was like, I want to give this a try uh, and just see what it's like. It's a theater background. I was kind of confused about liking drag. I really didn't like it at the time. I remember calling it gross, but I wanted to try it on the stage with a couple of my friends. Um, a queen named Alana Filipina saw me perform at that show and offered me my first paid spot at a local bar in Greeley, which is about 30 minutes from Fort Collins the other way. So I did that show. And after that show, she made me a cast member. And I had been, I'd been on cast with that group for the last 10 and a half years. That was like my first start. One show a month that I was guaranteed to perform two numbers and get paid for once a month outside of anything in Fort Collins, close by as well. And I stuck with that. That was like my first big break into getting paid for this being an art or realizing that I could get a check. How big, how big much did you scream when you got that? <laughs> <laughs> I screamed, but I th I'm pretty sure it was like 40 bucks. It was, like, which is great. But I think it was like 40 bucks on a good day and a couple dollars in tips. So, and, so I'm curious was, about that question uh, or about that. How did that 40 bucks make you feel though? Made me feel great, but 
I, I, I couldn't even pinpoint it. It's so long ago. But if I were to, to think of it in that moment, I'd pretty much be like, I can go eat. I probably went to, I probably spent it on Taco Bell. I'm not going to lie. I probably <laughs> got so excited that I made some money and I blew it all at a fast food place right after. Yeah. Because our thing has always been, anytime we've launched a new product or when we originally started, it was like, if we can make $5 here or $10 there, or $50 there, if we can do that. We can definitely multiply that. And so to me, it was always, it's always been, whenever we can make money, it's always like an inspiration. Okay, we can do this and we can do, do this consistently to a point where we can earn a living and then maybe even thrive and, and help other people beyond that. Absolutely. Yeah. So thinking back to that time, I know you said it's been a while. How much money do you think you had invested in your quote unquote business? Because at that point, it wasn't, wasn't necessarily a business, right? But how much did you invest in yourself and everything that it takes to get on stage at that point? Hundreds of dollars, a couple thousand. But you have to realize I went this stupidity route of maxing out credit cards. I maxed out an Amazon credit card, uh, several other visas, because I wanted all of this drag at one time. And that bit me in the ass. And that's where it really came back to realize that I wasn't capable of making that money back in a timely fashion and getting calls. Then I was owing more money. It was, it was, it got to a really depressing, scary stage because I went into it in the wrong way, but I started off by investing a lot of money. So just maybe in, in line, uh, in light of that, you said I went about it the wrong way. What would you say to someone who is thinking about doing this? What what would you suggest that they maybe do bef- instead of saying, I'm just going to start swiping the card and spending $4,000 on Amazon and makeup and blah, blah, blah? Honestly, if you were going to do any, if I were to go back and redo it, I'd probably stick with my one $500 limit credit card so that I could get the bare essentials for uh, more feasible makeup, you know, a couple pairs of tights, an outfit and a wig, something very easy in that amount. And I would, before even investing in it, if I was serious about doing this and going back, I'd figure out what shows were available. And that's the other thing. 10 years ago, not many shows happened in Colorado. You had three main bars and each bar had one main show and they had a pretty set cast and they had some pop-up benefits and they had some pop-up, you know, tip spot opportunities, but there wasn't a lot of drag for newer entertainers at the time. Um, but I would do more research to, to figure out how much I make each weekend that I'm doing in a show base pay wise. And then what I'm bringing in tips, which is what I do now. Um, I'd be just a little bit smarter about it than saying, I'm going to spend thousands of dollars. And just, I just know I'm going to, with my talents, bring in all this money. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is that uh, as a drag queen or someone who is becoming a drag queen, that you would suggest that they would just stick the tip in financially rather David than Donald. going all in, right? I think. Yep. I would, I would say stick, stick the tip in, find one, <laughs> one card that gives you some rewards with a very low balance. I would uh, be a little bit thriftier, go to older entertainers and ask for hand-me-downs or discounted things. Oh. I would not worry about spending the highest quality of makeup when you clearly don't know how to apply it or the fanciest shoes when you clearly don't know how to walk in them yet and go to thrift stores go to ARCs, get crafty and learn how to make some things. You can save a lot of money by sewing your own garments, making your own hair. Even if you're not amazing at it, you can make up what the look might lack for other people in a personality sense. If you don't have the most fabulous outfit on, your personality can upsell the garment that you have and they can appreciate that you've made it or put the time in. But mm-hmm. going so hard in, it's, the, it's also the opposite of when people are like, oh, I refuse to start drag until I have all of these things and I refuse to start drag until I'm perfect at my makeup. You're not going to get there. Just start doing it, but don't go crazy at the beginning. Psychologically, I'm wondering, you know, the the, the idea of scaling slowly to the point where you can buy all the fabulous and expensive stuff because you can afford it. I mean, you're in an industry that's all about performing and slaying and looking fierce and impressing people. And the easiest way in America to do that is to have the, Manola Blahniks and the Gucci stuff and all the product and, and I'm sure that there are name brand products for for drag queens that I'm not familiar with but comparable uh, products how psychologically challenging or easy is that to say okay I'm going to scale up to that I'm going to buy the second third or tier level product um, because I can't necessarily afford it when you're around all these queens who are just fierce 
it's scary. When I was trying to invest in my first nice wig, which was $125, that's a lot of money for me at that time. Mm-hmm. I felt I felt like the baddest bitch in the moment, but I ruined the wig in two months because I didn't know how to take care of it. It was an investment that went down down the tube. And that's mm-hmm. a lot of the newer entertainers feel this way, that they need to have some of the, uh, you say Gucci and Prada, the Monique V's, the Eddie Couture's, the, the uh, Joshua Pontes. These are designers in the drag world that are known for making those really glamorous, perfectly fit and tailored outfits, uh, dreams beyond imagine. But there's nothing more infuriating than somebody wearing one of those designer outfits and being the most unentertaining performer on the stage and they need to be carried through with that fancy outfit and i have seen people go and get khakis and a blouse from the store and make me laugh and feel more entertained in that same time frame so thinking about the like the it feels so good when you can invest into those nicer quality products but if you don't know how to take care of them it's money down the tube and you don't need that to be a successful drag entertainer. I would say, like, if you look at Evie, Evie's from Denver, Colorado. Evie, obviously, she was a winner of a, a previous season on the show. All crafting, all uh, unconventional materials. Her drag was never based around designer, expensive, or anything. It was personality, energy, storytelling, and what she could bring together. And that's something I think inspired a lot of even the Colorado scene, the drag scene here, to dive into being a little bit more crafty and not feeling like they need to spend $4,000 on a leotard. Right. $4,000 for a leotard? Is that what they cost? Sometimes. It depends on who's making it and what embellishment and stuff wow. like that. I yeah. have no idea. It can. Well, Outfits. Yeah. It's, and who's who's making it and how they quantify their time and everything yeah. too comes into play. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they're just like designers, right? There's designers at all levels of the income spectrums, right? If you've got lots of money, I'm going to make you something that I'm going to charge you lots of money for. That's just yeah. how, how the, economically we work. Right. And, and for a lot of people, that is how they can then help other people work too. Right. right? They employ other people to help them and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And if you want these nicer things, people want them instantly. Almost. They want yeah. them in the moments that they don't have money to do it, or they want them because in this exact moment and there's no, planning most of the outfits i go through in cycles and i have planned for pride outfits and made deposits for outfits in december and january knowing that the designer will take more time to get them ready but i'm making payments throughout the months and i'm not just putting them all in one and then when pride comes around i have my stuff and most other entertainers are sitting here being trying to get their stuff made last minute yeah, you, makes, you know, in the in the personal finance world, we call that a sinking fund. Um, and folks, this is what we John and I have a sinking fund for vacations. We have a sinking fund for taxes. We have a sinking fund for the holidays where we set aside a little bit of money all year round. And then we can do, you know, because back in the day, John and I used to go on vacation. We throw it all on a credit card. We come back from that vacation. We're like, OK, where do we want to go next? And before wow. that credit card is paid off, we've already charged another vacation on it. Yeah. And, and that's I, I mean, that's just that just. This is the business mindset, right? This is the this is the one thing that, as individuals, that we need to think about. What? How are we going to run our business? And if you are want want to be a self employed queen, you're going to have to think of that business mindset. What are your expenses? How much are you going to spend on makeup? How much are you going to spend on marketing? How much are you going to spend on clothing? All of those that travel, all that stuff has to be considered as part of your business. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have a business budget and do you do a P&L and you're kind of managing all these expenses and you know, like, uh, you know, June is always probably, you know, bigger, busier month for me. So I've got to reserve some funds for that. And I don't know, December is a little bit slower because the holidays, do you do, you do that kind of forecasting yeah. as well? I do. Um, I usually split it up. Pride is its own, own s- little segment. June, the month of June is its own uh, separate analysis i guess but um i know what months are busiest i know what months i need to pull what i call the favor card i don't really reach out to my friends or certain venues for shows or opportunities throughout the year until i get to the month of march for example or um the month of august because those usually take a downward slide in business so then i pull in the hey if you have a spot open i would love to work with you whatever the rate is, I'll take it because I know that business is going to be slower for sure. It's the same thing when it comes to when I make large expenses, I put money away for taxes every single month. 
Um, I put stuff, I have four different savings accounts that I've created and I put different monetary values into each one for different reasons over the course of the last couple of years. Um, and so that I'm not caught off guard. I have like a rainy day account. I have a, uh, if a costume account, stuff like that. Um, but I, I do track all of that. How many tips I get in certain ones? Uh, what is my base pays for the start of the month? So that I know if I made zero dollars in tips, like nobody tipped me a single dollar, this is what I'm walking by at the end of the month. I also don't spend any money. It's the weirdest thing. I don't spend any money that I make for the month or transfer to any accounts until the month is over. So uh, I don't, um, everything from every check, every dollar bill, cash, whatever it is, every piece is put into different accounts at the end of the month to start fresh for the next month. Very interesting. I'm, 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 I don't, uh, break. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, were you, did, a, did another queen taught you? Is there a class out there or did you have to learn this your, your, on your own? <laughs> I, I created these crazy ass systems in my head. They worked for me. Um, or like you, if anywhere I work, you know, it's a big thing in the drug industry to trade your dollar bills in for bigger bills. And I'm probably the only person that refuses to do that. And I've done that for five years. All of my single dollar bills go into different accounts than my bigger dollar bills go into different accounts. My checks go into different accounts. My Venmos go into different accounts, all mentally. But I taught myself these systems. It works for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and well, clearly it's working for you, yeah. right? Because you're, you have been able to keep doing it so let's let's talk about what's going on for you right now right this, okay. this seems like exciting times for you uh you recently won best new queen on the scene uh Colorado's dragon entertainer of the year those kinds of things let's uh, talk about what's going on for you right now yeah um i would so those happened a little, a little bit earlier in in the years 2017 2018 i'd say my biggest focuses right now are expanding Jessica as a business. So uh, for nine and a half years, I did everything from my own poster designs to promoting management, bookings, music, stuff like that. And I hired an assistant a year and a half ago, which is the best decision ever. Nice. I hired a publicist, which was the best decision after, uh, ever. I hired a social media marketing team that helps me not only film comment, get me brand deals, also edits content for me to approve and build clips from. Um, and we do brainstorming for how we're going to market Jessica Lahore. I hired a merchandising manager at the beginning of this year. And so that's incredible. But I pretty much saved for nine and a half years and said, I'm sick of doing this myself and started putting money in. And I've, I've seen some of the rewards. They haven't been a hundred percent the financial rewards that I'm looking for, but that's the, the work hard method. My work schedule has not changed. I was able to increase rates. I was able to get more work because of where I'm at and have people focus on other things. So my biggest thing has been formulating this team, making it uh, strong where we traveled to LA together last month and that was super successful. I'm bringing a couple of them to Austin, Texas in two days, which I'm hoping is going to be super successful. Uh, we're rented out booths at DragCon this year for the first time. And I'm not a drag race girl uh, by any means, but I want to show up like I am one of them. Yeah. I'm bringing 12 people and we're doing a whole set design and I'm doing a big merchandise release in May and I'm doing a 50 city tour at the end of the year. And I'm trying to do things that uh, aren't, local in this in that way i don't know if that makes sense no totally yeah, yeah well if you want to grow you gotta expand your horizon expand so, so. Yeah, right it's so it's always exciting when you're able when you're at a point in your business where you can grow your team because you can take some of the stuff off your plate that you rather you know you neglect because you don't have time or you're not necessarily the best at and you can reach more people by having people help you expand your, your business and, uh, and 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 grow scale for yourself but it's a whole other other level of responsibility because now you're you're responsible to making sure that you bring in the money not just so you can pay your own bills but you've got to pay your team and, and they rely on that income so that they can support their families and, and whatnot how how has that changed your 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 mentality your oh my gosh uh, <laughs> it has made me significantly more aware of what what I want to see futuristically for what Jessica Lahore is. When I made these decisions to hire these people on, I really sat down and said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to go all in. Um, thankfully, all the people that I've hired, I've worked with um, in different settings. And we've set up agreements that don't 
put me through the hole. I've spent too much money on people that have backed out, taken money from me, stolen from me, uh, not provided the services or the products that they have. And so I have a lot of trust issues, which is another reason I did everything myself. I feel like I finally got the right team down. Nice. Um, but my, my mindset has been more focused on not making money, but getting, getting my name out there. That's the phase that I'm in right now this year mm-hmm. is putting the investment. We've already done all of the content creating, the, the outreach, the following is now showing that part. Um, yeah, I think you've it's, got, it's, what, 90, almost 90,000 followers almost on, 90, Inst- yeah. on Instagram. Yeah, you're, whoever, whoever your social media people are, like you are always on. Now, almost every yeah. time I go on Instagram, your one of your videos or, or, or reels is one of the first things to pop up. And that's one thing to, to say the investment has proven off because that's within a year time. That's fifty to 60,000 within the last year. Wow. Nice. Congratulations. A year ago this time, I was probably at 16, 17, 18,000. Yeah. And you can tell by having somebody focus a little bit more on the editing, the styling, the analytics as they're constantly changing in the social mm-hmm. media world of when people are looking at content and when you should post. And if reels are popular right now, that's been really helpful. Yeah, but I yeah, my, good. No, I'm just saying my focus has been more team oriented is really where the the biggest switch has been. It's not about me right now. It's about my team. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's what I think that a lot of people don't understand. At least we were naive. I've never thought about a drag queen having 12 people behind them. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's a legit business. Yeah. It's a legit, legit small business. And, but it takes that kind of a team because you can't be an amazing performer as well as an amazing designer, as well as amazing at social media metrics tracking, right? You just can't be, nobody's good at all that stuff. You got to stay in your lane and focus on what you're good at so you can hire other people to do what they're, what they're good at. But I don't think a lot of people who enjoy drag, watch the shows and go to the shows, really fully understand the effort that goes in actually putting on even just one or two songs. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of it is people just don't want to do it. It's, uh, it looks so cool to them. But nobody actually wants to put the time, money, effort, or dedication into it as well. You know, you have those, those entertainers that get their, their check, and it's gone by the end of the night because they spent it on alcohol <laughs> at the end of the show, yeah. which is to each their own. You can spend your money and drink and do whatever you want to. I've been there. I've done that. But why do that if you have put, you've now made no money for the night? If all of your tips and all of your money from the evening went to the fast food at the end of the show – or uh, the drinks at the bar, you buying shots for people, or a vacation that you couldn't afford to begin with, you're not making any money to survive minimally. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's too hard, but people don't want to put the mindset into it. Right. It's definitely a, 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 a challenging mindset to stay focused like that. Yeah, it, and I would say, especially in that environment, right, where everybody, you know, a lot of us, we get, we get it when we have a corporate job or not necessarily a corporate job. I mean, I know people in construction who do this, people who are, uh, have a lot of different jobs. They get off of work and they go to a happy hour, right? And you have a couple of drinks and the expectation is, right, okay, you're going to happy hour and then you're going to go home. But you're oftentimes entertaining people at the end of the day where you have a large contingency of people who are standing in that room who want that party to keep on going forever, right? And so mm-hmm. you get off and get off the stage and everybody is there and let's have a drink and let's have another drink and let's have another drink. And, you know, all of a sudden it's 145 or 245, 345, whatever time the bar closes at wherever venue you're at. It's, it's so easy to get caught up in that moment of let's just keep the fun going. And unfortunately, I will say that that is part of the reason why John and I ended up in our $51,000 in credit card debt is because we didn't want the party to ever end. Whether this is that why I was party... driving on North 25 at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It, was, it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't just that. Happy hours that went way longer than a happy hour. It was the vacation, needing to take a vacation every quarter so we could keep up with the A-lister gays and talk to them yeah. parties about where we went to. It's kind of built into our community that this is... Is the way we live right and Absolutely. if you want to have a successful business it's really hard to do that and have a successful business so i appreciate that you're saying it's it, you know you need to take if you want to go ahead do whatever you want but if you want to have a successful business take a step back and ask yourself what do i want to do with some of this money how else can i help myself grow with some of this money 
Well, and see, what you did is where I'm at now in opposite. I spent so much time saying no to opportunities with friends. I've lost many friends because I didn't want to stay all night. I had to get up for an early show the next day or I was booking this or I knew I had to do five events or whatever it was or I had to sit down and build set lists or send out emails or send out proposals or something like that. And over the course of many years, lost so many friends um, so many connections because I was more focused on working and hustling. And now I'm in this phase where I don't get, I don't get invited out or to after parties or anything like that. And I kind of want to be more social and invested into the, the people that I have. But now I have such a small group that people take me too seriously, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. I, I very much am uh, unapproachable because I'm, I'm too serious about it. When in reality, you just caught me at the times that I was working Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, it's not now I want a vacation. <laughs> right? no. It's not 1950s where we all can go have a, a martini during the middle of our work day, and you were in the middle of your work day. Right? Well, I so. can have a martini in the middle of my work day. <laughs> I'm allowed yeah. to drink at my job. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Nice. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Very informative. We really appreciate everything that you've shared with us, getting to peek behind the curtains at what it's like to be in, in the drag world. And I, I know that there are a lot of people not only learn from what you have to say here, but some of, some of them of our listeners may even put some of this into practice. So we appreciate that. So if our audience wants to connect with you, how do we connect with you online, social, all of the, yeah, so my website is the best way to learn about my services, about me, my drag family, and book me at www.jessicalahorelwhor.com. No E, because I'm illiterate. And <laughs> then uh, you can also find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, TikTok, uh, Spotify, Apple Music as well for all kinds of content in the awesome. other realms. So. Definitely. Thank you. And, and I will say, I'll, I'll just add one last point here, especially in light of what we see going on um, in America right now with drag queens. I do appreciate that you do remind folks that you are Miss Jessica for the families. So all of the gay, lesbian, trans, bisexual, queer parents out there, we thank you on their behalf because they have a great name to be able to share with their kids as to who this person is. So thank you. Absolutely. Of course. And thank you so much for taking the time to, to ask me about the business side. Not many people, and I feel like we just touched the surface. We could continue yeah. to talk all day, but thank you for being interested in, in something I'm very proud of. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for being brave enough to, to share that. And we'll maybe have to have you back and we'll dive deeper into the, the nuts and bolts of how you pay your taxes and how you're structured. In the organization. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't come. No. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. The mission of queer money is to financially empower the LGBTQ plus community. Join us in thanking Capital One for supporting that mission. Thank you, Jessica, for a great interview and for having the courage to give us a glimpse behind the scenes of what it takes to be a fabulous queen. Thank you for joining us for another episode, folks. This week's newsletter includes your queer money takeaway and resources mentioned in this episode. Then join us this Thursday when we share the top 10 most affordable LGBTQ plus friendly cities for LGBTQ plus people to retire in. A big one for everyone here. Next Tuesday, we interview Teresa Gilarducci about her new book, Work, Retire, Repeat. That is also a great book or topic for wannabe retirees. So stay tuned for that. Thank you and have a great week. Mm -hmm.